If I leave this world of sorrow sometime before you do, just look for me in heaven and we'll talk the ages through. But if at first you fail to see me, let me tell you where I'll be. I'll be thanking Christ my Savior for saving a wretch like me. Don't look neath the gates of pearl. Don't look on the streets of gold. Don't look by the walls of jasper, nor among the many sights untold. For I've been longing and I've been waiting for the precious Holy One to see. There I'll be through the countless ages. Look for me at Jesus' seat. But if you should reach that city before my time has come, perhaps you'd like to greet me when my race down here is run. Just wait for a soon be coming across life's heavy sea. And I'll tell you now, my brother, just where to wait for me. Don't wait neath the gates of pearl. Don't wait on the streets of gold. Don't wait by the walls of jasper, nor among the many sights untold. For I've been longing and I've been waiting for the precious Holy One to see. There'll be through the countless ages, wait for me at Jesus' feet. Amen. Amen. Okay. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Me and Jesus, me and Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. Me and Jesus, me and Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. To walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Me and Jesus, me and Jesus, safe and secure from all our arms. Me and Jesus, me and Jesus, leaning on the To dread, what have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning. I'm not scared. Oh, I'm terrified. <laughs> Lighten up a little, folks. It's Thursday night. We're in church. Okay, are you ready for this? Okay, here we go. Twas a day in early springtime by an ancient wayside well. Eliezer paused to rest his camel train. Decked in jewels rich and rare, 
back to Abraham, his master far away. For Rebecca loved her Isaac, and he loved Rebecca fair. Oh, it must have been a happy wedding day. Oh, get ready, the evening shadows fall. Don't you hear the Eliezer call? There's going to be a wedding, our joy will soon begin. In the evening when the camel train comes in. So the blessed Holy Spirit from the Father God above has come down to earth to find a worthy bride. For our Isaac over yonder has prepared his tents of love, and he wants his fair Rebecca by his side. We have left our kinfolk gladly, we've bade the world goodbye. We're going to a land beyond the sky. Where we'll soon behold our Isaac in the blessed eternity. What a happy, happy meeting that will be. Oh, get ready, the evening shadows fall. Don't you hear the Eliezer call? There's going to be a wedding, our joy will soon begin. In the evening when the camel train comes in. In the evening when the camel train comes in. <sighs> That's like <laughs> fuck fever, man. Amen. 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 Okay, I think you're ready for some red hot coals. Amen. No ashes tonight, brother. <laughs> and uh, we'll take everything to God. I think you're ready for it. Listen real closely to the preaching of the Word of God. Amen. <clears throat> okay, it's good to be back with you tonight. I'm glad you're here. And I trust that uh, you'll get a blessing from the Word of God tonight. Take your Bible, turn to Revelation chapter 2, if you would. And um, I've learned some things already since I've been up here this time. Uh, I always learn something from art when I come up, and this year I learned how to successfully make a right-hand turn in busy traffic from the left-hand lane. <laughs> Cross two lanes and onto the off-ramp, man, from the extreme left-hand lane. Man, <laughs> God was with us all day, man, I'll tell you what. <laughs> His driving's improving. <laughs> Amen, man. Amen. It's doing good. I'm glad he has a big, white Ford truck. <laughs> Amen. But we had a good time today and uh, went over and saw Brother Butterfield's church over across the way here and very impressive building. And uh, then we went down to Amish country and had a very impressive meal. And uh, we had some good fellowship all day long. And the day goes fast. I'll tell you what, you get up in the morning and, you know, I smelled that ribeye steak grilling out there on the stove. I couldn't hardly wait to get out in the kitchen. Shirley was working hard. No grape nuts this year. It, it wasn't, I thought it was ribeye, but it was sausage, and, uh, but that's, that was good, that was good, and uh, we started out by eating and fellowshipping, and I did some studying and reading, and then we went on from there and had a good day, and I really enjoy uh, the, the kind of day we had. Weather-wise, can't, can't get any better. I'm surprised, and I'm sort of offended that no one has said, Brother McDowell, you brought beautiful weather with you this year. <laughs> Every year, raining, snowing, ice, cold, and you said, you brought that weather up here with you. It wasn't like that before you got here. Now, I mean, it's golfing weather, it's springtime, no one has said anything about me bringing the good weather. <laughs> but wasn't it a beautiful day? Amen. Okay. Y'all ready? The singing was good. I enjoyed it. The specials were delightful. And it's been a long time since I heard that Eliezer call. That's a great song. I remember the first time I ever heard it. And I remember who sang it. 
and it was um <laughs> no no i just i just like to make sure that i pronounce the name right dewey conley <laughs> and his wife uh the first time i ever heard that song and i remember the first time that i ever heard no one ever cares for me like jesus and uh, i heard the man who wrote that song sing it he was probably in his late 70s or 80s down there in pensacola and he came down and gave his testimony as to how god uh, laid that heart uh, that song on his heart and um, after a very a very sad uh, situation in his life and then he got up and with a cracking voice he sang that song but you know what was so beautiful about that song was not the the, the notes that he hit or didn't hit but it was the spirit and it was the soul and the heart uh, from which that song came that was such a blessing and every time I sing it or every time I hear a group of folks sing that song I always think of that old man that uh, wrote the song Revelation chapter 2 Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1 it says unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful once again for the opportunity just to be here. Lord, I'm thankful for the singing that has stirred my heart and soul already tonight. And I'm thankful, Lord, to be able to meet with this group of Christians and have fellowship with them and preach the Word of God to them. But, Lord, we realize that our meeting is in vain if you don't meet with us. And yet, Lord, we've already experienced your presence and we've experienced uh, the fellowship of your Spirit in the singing of the songs. And now, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God might take the message and apply it to our lives and our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that you would fill me with your spirit and help me to preach the things that you want me to preach. And, Father, put your holy uh, unction upon the preaching of the word of God tonight. And, Lord, I just pray that there would be nothing in my heart, nothing in my life right now that would hinder the spirit of God from working in our midst and doing the work that needs to be done. Lord, we long for the day that you're going to come and get us out of this place. Lord, our prayer tonight would be, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Father, we want you to come, and we want to get out of this place and be with you forever. And yet, Lord, for some reason that we don't understand, you've tarried your coming. You've delayed, Lord, uh, from coming and getting us out of this world. And, and that, that only means that there's still work that needs to be done and things that you want us to do. And Lord, you've put this church here for a reason, for a purpose. And, Lord, it served your purpose for many years. And I pray that, uh, Father, into uh, the days that lie ahead, until you return, until you uh, rapture us out of here, that this church would be ever faithful to you, doing the things that you want them to do. Lord, protect us from the apostasy that is strangling Christians and churches all over uh, this country and this world tonight. Lord, uh, keep us safe from the devil who would love to destroy us, uh, who goes about us a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Lord, I pray that you would help us uh, collectively as a church and individually and uh, keep us safe from the adversary. Lord, I pray that we'd go forward from this place tonight 
to look for opportunities to serve you. Lord, we pray for open doors. We ask, Lord, that you would allow us to do more for you in the days that lie ahead than what we've done in the past. Father, I pray now that you would just uh, have your way in everything that's said and done in this uh, uh, service tonight. And may Jesus Christ be magnified. May you be lifted up, Lord, in our midst. If there's anyone here, Father, that does not know you as their Savior, I pray that tonight would be the night that the Holy Spirit knocks on their heart's door and they would open the door and invite Jesus Christ to come in and save their soul. Lord, I pray that for every saved person in here, that, Lord, you would stir them and, Father, uh, help them to get close to you. And, Lord, send us out of here with a desire to do your work. And I ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. In Ephesians chapter 2, you have a church that the Lord says some things to. Ephesus is the place that the Apostle Paul had a great revival and a great meeting. Paul visited Ephesus and as an evangelist had great success. If you would take your Bible and turn back to Acts chapter 19 for just a moment, uh, you find the account of Paul coming to Ephesus and it says there in verse 1, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? Here the Apostle Paul comes upon a group of disciples that were disciples of John. They had heard John's message. They had believed John's message, but they had not heard that the Holy Ghost had come. And so Paul preaches unto them Jesus. If you look there in verse 4, it says, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. And he preached to them Jesus, told them about Jesus Christ, the one that came after John, and these people believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and they uh, got baptized in the name of Jesus. Uh, Paul was going about the city of Ephesus, and he started to do uh, miraculous things. He, as an apostle, uh, had these apostolic powers in his life. And you read there in verse 11, And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. They were bringing people that were sick. They were taking... Uh, pieces of his garment and uh, laying them upon the sick and the diseases were disappearing and, and the evil spirits went out of the people and uh, Paul was doing a great work and, and great miracles in Ephesus. Uh, you find there that there were some vagabond Jews uh, that took upon themselves to try to exercise some demons and uh, out of a man. And the uh, seven sons of Sceva there uh, uh, tried to do that in the name of Jesus. And it backfired on them. And this man leaped on them. And, and you read about that in the town of Ephesus where Paul was preaching. You go down there a little bit further and uh, you find out that he made an attack on the, uh, the, the goddess Diana which was the great goddess of, uh, of Ephesus and, and even these people thought uh, she was the great goddess of the entire world and they had a great image to, the, uh, uh, to Diana, this uh, goddess, this idol that they were worshiping and Paul started preaching against that thing and he was preaching against it so hard that people turned away from Diana and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Demetrius there was uh, worried that uh, the craft that they were in would... Uh, be done away with. Look in verse 24. It says, For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation, and, and said, Sirs, uh, we kn ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, you see and hear that uh, not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that there be no gods which are made with hands. I mean, Paul wasn't afraid to stand up and right there in front of all those idol worshippers and all those men who were making these idols of silver and condemning those things and saying God's not uh, behind this type of thing and you're worshiping gods that are made with hands and you need to turn
turn to the true and living God and worship Him. And brother, I'll tell you what, there was a great stir in the town of Ephesus, in the city of Ephesus. It said people, in verse 19, many of them which also used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. In verse 18, and many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. I mean, Paul's preaching. The Holy Spirit of God is moving. People are believing on Jesus Christ. People are turning away from idols. A church is established there in Ephesus and that church becomes a great church in Asia Minor. Two generations later, John on the Isle of Patmos, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the church of Ephesus. It says there in chapter 2 of Revelation, God says about the church of Ephesus, He said, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. God said about this church, He said, I know your works. In other words, all these years after the Holy Spirit had done such a great work in Ephesus, all these years those people had stayed there and that church had continued on and God was watching that church and God saw what they were doing and God had His eye on them and God said that He approved of the church of Ephesus. He said, I approve of what you're doing. He said, I've been watching and I see what you're doing. You know, I believe God's got His eye on the church tonight. I believe God sees every church, and I'm talking about local assemblies all throughout this country and all throughout this world, and He's watching and He's seeing what they are doing. God has been watching this church up here on this hill for the last... 28, 30 years, whatever it's been. He approved of the church of Ephesus. I believe God approves of this church. I believe the blessings of God are here on this church. I believe God wants to continue to do a great work in this part of Canton with Bible Believers Baptist Church. I believe that God has used this church in the past, that He's watching this church tonight, and that He is still able to deal with the people in this church and motivate them and stir them to go out and do a work for Him. God watches churches. Church of Ephesus, he approved of their sacrificial service. Look in chapter 2 and verse 2. He said, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. They worked. They labored. They had evangelistic zeal. Ephesus The church of Ephesus was a beehive of activity. God approves of a church that will roll up their sleeves and go to work for Him and be evangelistic and will labor for His honor and glory. The church of Ephesus was out winning souls. The church of Ephesus was laboring and working and they were waiting, they had patience, and they were following the leadership of the Lord. They were laboring for the Lord. This church over the years, there's been much labor. More than what I know, many of you know it better than me. But as I walk through this church, I see the printing presses back here that for years and years and years have been putting out gospel tracts and people writing for tracts and mail coming in that mailbox out there and people requesting tracts and they go out by the thousand, out by the thousand. You know something? God approves of that kind of stuff. God likes that. 
I think God blesses a church that will print the Word of God in a track form and put it out and put it out and put it out. And this church has been doing that for years. And I believe if God uh, could write a letter to the uh, church here, Bible Believers Church, He would say, keep on doing the printing. I approve of that. Much is being accomplished. God approves of a church that will go out and preach on the street. There, Spurgeon said one time that when it comes to street preaching, you don't have to prove and you don't have to show evidence for preaching on the street. He said you have to show more evidence for preaching in a building. <laughs> than you do for preaching out in the open. That's what Spurgeon said. You know, something I studied that through, and I believe that to be so. I mean, where did Noah preach? He didn't have a church building set up. He just preached out there. When he, him and his boys were building that ark, he just preached out there in the open. Where did Jeremiah preach? Jeremiah the prophet went through the streets of the city and he preached the Word of God and he, and he told him what God was going to do. Where did John the Baptist preach? He didn't have the first Baptist church. I mean, John the Baptist, he just went out there and he preached to where the people are, uh, where they were. He just went out in the open and preached. You come through the history of the church, you come through uh, and study church history, you'll find that God did great things and moved in great and mighty ways and great revivals were had in brush harbors and out in the open and out in the fields. And John Wesley would go out in the fields and people would gather there by the thousands to listen to the preaching of the Word of God. You don't have to show evidence for preaching out on the street. You have to show more evidence that the, that the preaching needs to be done in a building than you do for out in the street. And I believe God blesses a church that will go out there on the street and take a public stand for the Lord Jesus Christ and stand on the corner and pass out tracts and sing the old hymns and say, Thus saith the Lord and hold up the Word of God and maybe it might make some of you uncomfortable. But brother, I'll tell you what, you go out there and the Lord goes with you. And brother, if you've never been out on the street and just stood there and listen to some of these men preach the Word of God, you ought to go out there because God approves of that type of activity. I believe the church of Ephesus was a church that worked and labored. God said they did it. They worked. They labored. And they had patience. This is a church that rolls up its sleeves and goes canvassing. I think God approves of a church that will do that. That'll go out into different neighborhoods, knock on doors, say we're from Bible Believers Baptist Church and we're out here to invite people to church, but more than that, to invite people to Jesus Christ. Have you ever trusted Jesus as your Savior? Do you know where you're going when you die? And the Lord's up there saying, go get them, man. Go get them. That's good. I like that. I, I'm behind that kind of thing. I approve of that. The church of Ephesus was this kind of church. They labored. They work for the Lord. I come in here, I like to go back there and see that mission, mission board back there. Because this church has a heart for missionaries and supports missionaries. And I believe God's behind that kind of work. I believe God's behind a church that is willing to take children and have a, a Sunday school classes and junior church and children's activities and child evangelism classes and things like that. I believe God is for that kind of thing, behind that kind of thing, and He approves of that kind of thing. That's the way the church of Ephesus was. God said He approved of their sacrificial service. Not only that, but He approved of their suppression of evil. Look there in verse 2 again. He says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. He said, you couldn't bear them which are evil. They were alert to the mental and moral corruption that existed in their day and age. They made sure that corrupt and sinful men did not hold office in the church. They were intolerant when it came to sin. Sin, regardless of who was committing it, they were intolerant when it came to sin. The church of Ephesus put the emphasis on quality, not on quantity. 
They were looking for men that were sold out to the Lord that would not live a sinful and wicked life, but would live a life that was dedicated unto God. I believe that's what God wants us to be in this day and age. Men and women that are sold out to Him, that will live lives that are pleasing to Him, and that we would be on guard to suppress sin and wickedness and evilness. God wants that in a church. God approves of that kind of thing. Today, churches will just about accept anything. I saw in the paper today, it was brought to my attention, that the power team is going to be over at uh, Canton Baptist Temple, I believe it is. The power team. I don't know anything about the power team. If somebody would say to me, Brother McDowell, I want you to get a power team together. You know something? I would think of prayer. I would think of gathering a group of people together and and getting down on our knees and getting before the throne of God and pouring out our heart unto God and crying unto God and asking God to rain down His power upon us. That is what I would think of when it came to a power team. I would not think about guys blowing up water bottles and bursting them. I would not think about guys breaking Louisville sluggers over their head or neck or or leg or whatever they do. You know something? God is not interested in a demonstration of physical power. God is interested in a demonstration of spiritual power. And brother, spiritual power does not come by men getting up and flexing their muscles and showing how strong they are and how much time they've devoted to physical exercise. I know what the Bible says about it. (laughs) Profiteth little. Isn't that what it says? Profiteth little. The church of Ephesus suppressed and were intolerant of sin. They wanted they wanted quality. They didn't want quantity. The church today has it reversed. They're not interested in the spiritual, moral quality of the members. They're interested on how many people they can get in. This driven purpose church and driven purpose life is a bunch of false baloney. It's people getting together and saying, we don't care what the Bible says. The end, the end does justify the means. And whatever means we can uh, get people in by is right. And as long as we're bringing them in and getting them out of the world and into this building on a Sunday morning, we are doing the work of God. See, that's what happens when you quit reading your Old Testament. Do you ever read about David wanting to bring the ark home? Man, he loved God and he wanted to bring the ark home. And he said, get that ark and load it up there and put it on that new cart. And they were bringing the ark home on that new cart and it hit a bump. And that fellow reached out there and put his hand on that ark and God killed him just like that. Man, David goes in the morning and he said, Lord, what's going on here? What in the world's happening? And uh, he got, gets with God and God shows him. God shows him through the law. That's not the way to move the ark. I've got a certain way. I've got a prescribed way to move that ark. And if you move it any other way, I'm not going to bless it. And so he told those Levites to go back there and put those rails through the rings on that ark and put it up on their shoulders and carry it on their shoulders. And God blessed it. You know what God's showing you there? God's showing you that there's a certain way to run things. There's a certain way to do things. And when it comes to a church, God isn't going to bless. I mean, people might come in, but the Holy Spirit's going to go out. People might come in, but you're not going to see God doing something when it's done the wrong way. You ever read about King Ahab and Jehoshaphat? Ahab was a wicked king and Jehoshaphat was a good king. Remember that story? And, uh, and, and Ahab said, I want you to go up to Ramoth Gilead uh, with me and, and we're going to go up there and, uh, and, and whip up on the Syrians. And, uh, 
And, and Jehoshaphat said, well, we, we better listen to the Lord about this thing. And he said, I, I want to hear a word from the Lord. And so 400 false prophets of Ahab were brought in. And they said, in unison, go up to Gil- Ramoth Gilead and prosper. Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper. And, and Jehoshaphat said, is there not yet here a, a prophet of the Lord that we, we can inquire of him? He said, yeah, there's one, <laughs> Micaiah, but I hate him because he always prophesies evil concerning me. I don't like him at all said, well, let not the king say so. Bring him on in here. And they brought him in, and he prophesied, told him exactly what was going to happen. They went up anyway. And Jehoshaphat, when he came back and he was returning uh, back home, a prophet met him in the way and said, why are you helping the ungodly? Why are you doing this thing? And then the next thing you read about Jehoshaphat is he built ships to go and pick up gold in Ophir. And God destroyed and broke those ship up in Ezon Geber. You know why? Because Jehoshaphat had joined up once again with Ahab's son. He was doing it the wrong way. He wanted to do, to do something good by going and getting gold and bringing it back. But God wouldn't let him do it. Because he was doing it the wrong way. Now you know something? That gold is like souls out there. And if we're going to go out and win souls and reach souls and get people saved and get people in, there's a way that God says to do it. And I'll tell you what, you're not going to read it in Rick Warren's book. You're going to read it in God's book right there. And God said about the church of Ephesus, He said at the church of Ephesus, I approve of you because you cannot bear them which are evil. The church today not only bears them that are evil, but invites them that are evil to come in. I read in the Flaming Torch, I believe it was, the last issue that I read, Tennessee Temple has had its first rock concert on the campus of Tennessee Temple. Christian rock. Christian rock. Selling tickets and having Christian rock. You know what they're doing? They're saying to the evil, come on in. They're not interested in quality anymore. They're interested in quantity, getting people to come in. God said to the church of Ephesus, I like you. You're doing okay. He says, you're doing great. You cannot bear them that are evil. He approved of their steadfastness. Look in verse 3. He says, and has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Man, I mean, uh, they, they were people that just kept on keeping on. They were people that were patient. They didn't faint. They didn't grow weary in well-doing. They knew what it was like to be despised and to be hated, but they kept on going in spite of all of that, in spite of the fact that people laughed at them, in spite of the fact that people pointed to them and, and ridiculed them and hated them, but they just became steadfast and kept on going and kept on going and kept on going. And God said, I approve of that. The devil wants you to quit. The devil would like this church to fold. The devil would like that little church that I pastor down there to fold. The devil doesn't want you to keep going. He'll wear you down, try to wear you out. There'll be problems, there'll be hardships, there'll be heartaches, there'll be trials, there'll be all kinds of things. And sometimes uh, the Lord allows those things to come in and sometimes the Lord allows the devil to throw those things in your way. But you know something? He approves of the church. It'll keep on going. That'll keep on standing for the right thing. That'll keep on preaching the Word of God. That won't compromise that book and sell it out to an, to an NIV or a, a, a new ASV. He approves of a church that won't faint and will keep on going for His honor and glory. That's the church at Ephesus. He approved of their steadfastness. Be steadfast. Be steadfast for the Lord. Turn the heat up. Don't cut it back. Don't slack it off. Don't cut back on anything you're doing Add a few more things and keep on going a little harder, a little stronger, and a little longer for the Lord. And when He comes back, may we be found 
heading down the track with a full head of steam. Not just sitting, waiting, and hoping that the Lord comes back before some terror strikes again. Or that the Lord comes back before the nation goes belly up economically. Or that the Lord comes back before it gets too hard in this nation. Turn it up a notch. Keep on going for the Lord. The Lord approved of what they were doing at Ephesus. He approved of their spiritual discernment. In chapter 2 and verse 2, he says there at the end of that verse, And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. Christians are getting thin-skinned today. They say, oh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything to cause division. It doesn't help the cause of Christ when you divide with your doctrine and when you divide with your attitude and when you divide and, and you're mean-spirited. I'm not mean-spirited. Some people would think I'm mean-spirited because, you know, I'll point at something that's wrong and say it's wrong. Now, one night, there was a fellow that came into church and he hadn't been to church for a long time. And I was preaching through the book of Revelation. And he was a Catholic. And I was preaching that night on Revelation chapter 17. The whore sitting on the beast and riding the beast. And I said, oh no. I said, God, I'll change this. I'll change this message and I'll preach on 1 John chapter 5. And I'll preach a salvation message. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. I'll just rear back and do an old street preaching message there, and I'll preach on, this is the record, you know, and I had it all outlined in my mind how I'd go down through there, and I'd say, now Lord, if you want me to preach on Revelation chapter 17, i got to know right now, <laughs> because I don't want to offend this guy. I don't want him to get mad. We've been praying for him. I want to see him get saved. Man, the Lord just wouldn't let me preach on 1 John chapter 5. So I said, okay, Lord, here it goes, Revelation chapter 17. And man, I just got down with the plow, put it in deep, set it real deep in the ground, and I said, let's go. And man, we plowed that thing up, and he was sitting back there, way back in the back about where Gene Brown's sitting, and his face got red. And I mean, he was all holding his breath half of the time, and he was back there shaking his head like that. And I knew he was getting so mad, I thought he was going to get up before I was done preaching. But boy, as soon as I said amen at the last prayer, out the door he goes, and I ran after him. And I said, I know that you're upset. He said, you're lying. I said, I am, huh? He said, yes. He said, that's not papal Rome, that's pagan Rome. I said, oh, no. No, no. I said, I'll tell you what, you're upset right now. And I know you can't think real clear, but I'll tell you what you do. I said, you go home this week claiming to be. He's claiming that he has the apostolic powers at working in his life. I saw this truck coming through Pensacola one day. It was a pickup truck with a trailer behind it, and it said all nine gifts of the Spirit in operation. Healing. Tongues. Everything. Written all over the trailer. And I went up and blew the horn, waved at the guy, and the guy waved back. He had one of them funny like that. And I pointed at his trailer, and I said, yeah, I like it. He was like that. I said, Pull over, pull over. And he pulled off the side of the road. I said, I see you're a faith healer. He said, oh, yes, bless God. And I said, good, I'm a believer. He said, praise the Lord. And I said, the Baptist hospital is right down the road here. I said, follow me. We're going to go down here and empty out the Baptist hospital. Follow me. Man, I started off and he pulled off behind me. He came to the first light. I went straight and he turned left. <laughs> What's the matter? If God gave me the power to lay hands on somebody and heal them, I wouldn't set up a tent. I wouldn't go to an auditorium and have a, you wheel people in. I'd go down here to the hospital. And I'd go down to that first bed and I'd put my hands on that person. I'd pray and I'd say, God, get them up off of here and heal them right now. Check out. I'd go to the next room and do the same thing. I'd put Baptist Hospital out of business. 
You know something? God approved of the church of Ephesus. He said, yeah, when those fakers came around, and this was in the days of the apostles, and when those fakers came around, they tried them that claimed to be apostles and found them to be liars. God approved of their spiritual discernment. God wants us to be able to have spiritual discernment in these last days. You say, well, you shouldn't mock somebody else's religion. Elijah didn't have any problem with it. Jesus didn't have any problem with it. Read Matthew chapter 23. He didn't have any problem with it. Why should you? Why should you not stand for the truth and say this is what's right and this is what's true and we'll not bear them that are evil and we'll not be fooled by these people that say they are apostles and are not and we'll find them to be liars. Now, granted, when I was younger, I did a lot of foolish things. <laughs> you know, as I get older, I don't go in and disrupt a healing service. I don't stand outside the charismatic churches and tell them they're fakers. I don't do that. But I'll tell you what, when it's my time to get up and preach the truth, I'm going to tell you the truth about it. And if you love God and want the truth, you'll check it out to see if I'm telling you the truth in the Word of God. God approved of the church of Ephesus. Oh, look at here. Look what he says here. He says he approved of the fact that they stood against the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Look in verse 6. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. God says he hates some things. It would be good for us to know the things that God hates as well as the things that God loves. God says, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The word itself gives you a clue as to what the deeds of the Nicolaitans are. Nicolaitan has to do with conquering the laity. That's what the word means, conquering the laity. They set up a class division. They said, the clergy's over here, and the laity's over here. And the clergy is of God. They're the men of God. They have all the power of God. And the laity, they're just the common folks. And the clergy puts on its clerical robes. They hold their crosses. They take their holy water and flip it all over the place. And they're the holy men. And they're the men anointed of God. And they say, you must do this. And you must do this. And you must do this. And they conquer the laity and put them under bondage. And then they take their children back in the back room and molest them. The clergy, the Pope, His Holiness, bow down and kiss His foot. Lean over and kiss His ring. He is the vicar of Christ. He's a fake. God said, I hate that kind of stuff. But what about in our Baptist churches? When the preacher gets up and says, hey, I'm the man of God here. And God will tell me. And you stay in your place. And I've got the pastoral authority here. And you don't do anything unless you double check with me first. Wait. Do we have the clergy and the laity in our Baptist churches today? When Paul healed a man that was impotent on his feet in Lystra and healed that man, they came running out and they were going to do sacrifice and bow down and worship Paul. And he said, no, 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 don't do that. We are men like you with like passions. Don't you bow down to worship me. I'm a sinner saved by grace just like you. You don't bow down and worship me. But oh, there's many a preachers today that feel so good when people come down and gravel 
at their feet and exalt them as the great man of God. Listen, if you're saved, you love Jesus, you read your Bible, and you try to keep your family in a a Bible-believing church and raise your family according to the Word of God, let me tell you something, mister. You're the man of God. You're just as much a man of God as I am. And you're a woman of God. And we're all the same. And if it wasn't for the Lord Jesus Christ, we'd all go to hell. And the deeds of the Nicolaitans, God said, I hate that stuff. Yes, I understand that there's authority that a pastor has. But I'll tell you what. If he's a pastor of God, he doesn't need to flaunt his authority. And he's not out to make a reputation for himself. If he has the mind of Christ, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who made himself of no reputation. But we get these magazines all the time, and here's these great men of God. And you start reading about all the great things they do, and here's, here's me sitting down there in, in a town with 200 people, and I have about 80 people, 70, 80 people coming to church, and, and I don't preach to 3,000 people every Sunday. And he's the big man of God. Well, then, who am I? I'm just a little peon, too. God says, that's the deeds of the Nicolaitans right there. Mm -hmm. Separating the clergy from the laity, class division, and conquering them and bringing them into your power. I know pastors that would tell a person that God will show me what He wants you to do before He shows you. If God wants you to be a missionary, He'll tell me and I'll tell you. I like what Paul said. I better read it to you. It's in Galatians chapter 1. I like what he says here in Galatians chapter 1. He says, But I certify you, certify you, brethren, that the gospel, verse 11, but the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. God's the one that saved him, God's the one that called him, and God's the one that revealed things to him. And he said, no man did it. Now, if God wants you to be a preacher or a teacher... Or a missionary, you know who God's going to talk to about that? He's going to talk to you about that. And if a preacher tries to make you think that you can't make that decision between you and God, then there's something wrong with the preacher, there's nothing wrong with you. Deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. God says a lot of good things about this church, He approved what they were doing. But he says this in verse 4. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. They maintained a spirit of sacrifice they maintained a spirit of steadfastness. They maintained a spirit of separation. They maintained a keenness for detecting heresy. But God says there's something that man cannot see. No man can see this about you, but I'm watching you, and I can see it. And the only thing that God said that he had against the church of Ephesus. With all that he approved of, he said, there's something no one else can see but me. And he said, the thing that I see is you've left your first love. Doing good, but you left your first love. How could they be doing all this stuff and have left their first love? It's 
See, you can do things out of routine. You can do things out of duty. You can do things because you feel it's your responsibility. But you know why God wants you to do it? He wants you to do it because you're in love with Jesus. And he said the problem that you folks have here at Ephesus is you've left your first love. Remember how it was when you first got saved? And you fell in love with Jesus Christ. He saved you. You saw Him dying for your sins. Shedding His blood for your sins. You saw the awful hell that you were headed for. And Jesus saved you from that. And man, He put the joy in your heart. And the joy bell started the ring. And you loved Him. You didn't care who knew that you loved Him. You didn't care what they thought because you loved Him. He was your first love. And you loved Him because He first loved you. And you saw the love of God. And you experienced the love of God. And all you fell head over heels in love with Jesus. Man, you said, I'm going to sing a special. I'm going to get up in church and I'm going to sing a special. And I can't sing and I've never done it before and I'm scared to death. But boy, Jesus means so much to me and I love Him so much that I'm going to ask the preacher if I can get up and sing a special. And you got up one Sunday morning and your knees were knocking together and your voice was trembling and you didn't hit all the notes but you did it because you loved Jesus. And it was a blessing. It was a blessing. Because people were looking at somebody that was doing something for Jesus because they loved Him. Remember how it was the first time you ever witnessed for Jesus? Oh man, you just were so... You couldn't understand why everybody didn't get saved. You couldn't understand the reaction that you got when you ran to your buddies and you said, Man, guess what happened to me? The greatest thing that I've ever experienced. I got saved. And man, they didn't want to hear it. And you said, What's the matter? Man, it broke your heart. Because you love Jesus. And you wanted everybody to know how much Jesus meant to you. And you loved Him. And you weren't ashamed to carry the gospel tracts in your pocket. You weren't ashamed to leave them with the man at the gas station or the lady at the store. Because you were in love with Jesus. You'd come into church and oh, you would fellowship and it was so sweet to be around God's people and you didn't know how God's people really could be. You didn't know that they could be cantankerous. You didn't know that they could be mean-spirited sometimes. You didn't know any of that. You didn't see all that. Why? Because you were in love with Jesus. He was your first love. But time went on. Yes, you got to realizing that if I serve Jesus, He will reward me. Because He said He will reward me, that my labor is not in vain. So I'm going to go ahead, and I'm going to keep working, and I'm going to keep laboring. But down the road, something happened. Your heart got a little cold, but you kept going. Your heart got a little indifferent, but you kept going. You said, the rapture's coming. The judgment seat of Christ is coming. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep serving no matter what. That's what the church of Ephesus did. God said, I approve of what you're doing 
But this is the thing I have against you. You left. Your first love. Repent. Get that love back. Fall back in love with your first love. Or I'll come quickly and remove your candlestick. Return to your first love. Sometimes I think that many of our good, strong, Bible-believing churches maintain that front for truth and the militant spirit. But let me ask you this. Have you left your first love? Do you still love him? Do you still want to do something just because you love him? Not because anybody expects it. Not because anybody asks it. But do you still do it just because you love him? The human eye cannot see that. No one around the church of Ephesus that came in or out of the church of Ephesus could see that. But God said, I see it. And this is the only fault that I find with you. This is the only thing that I see that I don't approve of. That is, you left your first love. We've all done that at some time in our Christian life. Boy, there's nothing like getting the fire burning in your soul again. Like coming back to that first love and just saying, Jesus, I love you more than life, more than anyone on this earth. You are my love. You are my first love. And I always want you to be my love because you've loved me. Jesus, lover of my soul, you love me and I want to love you. And I want to walk with you every day because I love you. And I want to read your word because I love you. And I want to be a witness because I love you. And I want to live a life that is separated because I love you. Sometimes you just have to go back to your first love. Let's stand for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I pray tonight that you would speak to our hearts. Challenge us, Lord. Turn your spotlight of conviction on in our hearts. Show us our indifference. Show us our spiritual laziness. Show us our coldness. Show us the things, Lord, that keep us from being close to you. Show us the things that causes us to leave our first love. Lord, I pray that every person in here tonight would do a heart check and see if they be in love with Jesus Christ tonight. Lord, it's easy for us to say we love you because you saved us and we loved you because you first loved us. But Lord, when we love somebody, we want to be with them all the time. We want to talk to them. We want to listen to them. We just want to be around them. Lord, we need that from you. We need to see your love and feel your love. But Lord, help us to realize that you want us to love you back. Lord, help us help us to return to our first love. Father, if there's anyone in here that's never been saved, may they come to Jesus tonight and fall in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. What song will we sing? 382. 382. Softly and tenderly Jesus is calling Calling for you and for me
tonight, why don't you slip up here to this altar and get down on your knees and just talk to the Lord a little while. Maybe you just need to fall back in love. It's the same way in a marriage. Your first love and you first fall in love and then time goes on, you sort of take things for granted, don't you? You take for granted that they'll always be there. You'll take for granted that they'll always care. Sometimes that real display of love fades from your marriage. That happens in your relationship with Jesus. He loves you. And He wants to be your first love. And He wants you to return to your first love. Tonight, if you're cold, if you're not stirred, if you're not fired up, you've got a coldness inside you, a spiritual coldness, maybe you just need to come up here and say, Lord, I haven't been loving you like I ought to. And I want to go out here tonight loving you more than anything else. As we sing on the second verse, if God has spoken to your heart, you come. You come as we sing. Come on. Why should we carry when Jesus is pleading? Pleading for you and for me. Why should we linger and heed not His mercies? Mercies for you and for me. for a minute while people are praying here at the altar and is there anyone in here that would raise their hand and say I've never been saved brother McDowell I'm here tonight I was invited but I've never been saved and I'm concerned about my soul and will you pray for me would you raise your hand up and let me pray for you anyone like that in here tonight young or old Okay, I've seen no hands. Just continue to pray for a moment while these are here at the altar. If you need to come, there's still time. third verse. If you need to come, you can still come. Time is now filling the moments of blessing Passing from you and from me Shadows are gathering, deathbeds are coming Coming for you and for me
vegetables tomorrow night. That from the group I believe will say uh, we can get by with that, and we can use a couple for Saturday night. And, uh, so we'll go at that point now. But try your best to come back and bring somebody with you. There's a lot of folks need what you heard tonight. As far as we're closing prayer and speed, they will be closed out for Lord, we thank you for what you heard so far as we go and put it through. And Lord, help us to rekindle that fire or, or maintain it, Lord, this week. And pray the Holy Spirit of God will be with us for this week. As we heard last night, it will help us to fill the Spirit of God. And we'll take it out from here, Lord. In this place and uh, do something with it for your glory, Jesus. And we do, Lord, we want to love you like we should. And sometimes, Lord, we get in a routine, Lord, it's easy to do. God uh, help us to keep a check on our heart. Take, take us home safe for your night. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.